Welcome to the Texas House District 125 Special Election Runoff. Long time later. Uh, sponsored by the League of Women Voters of the San Antonio area and the City of Leon Valley. I'm Glenda Wollin, Vice President of Voter Service, and I'll be your moderator tonight. By now you've probably heard the date for the runoff has finally been set. <laughs> Election day is Tuesday, March 12th. Early voting is Monday through Friday, March 4th through 8th. Uh, before we get started, I would like to go over the guidelines the candidates have been given and some things that you need to know. Uh, first, there's no campaign material allowed in this room. So if you picked up some brochures, uh, there's some out there, just tuck them away so that you know if they can't be seen. And if you've got any campaign buttons on or anything, just take those off until after the forum. Uh, you should have been handed an index card uh, sometime before now. Uh, so that's for you to write down questions for the candidates. Um, if you just hold them up, uh, a volunteer will come around and collect it and give it to me. And those are the questions that I'll be asking the candidates. Um, the way this will be going is that each candidate will get two minutes for opening remarks. Um, I'll read each question and the candidates will each have 90 seconds to answer the question. Uh, the speaking order will rotate and then each candidate will have two minutes for closing remarks in the reverse order of the opening remarks. Candidates will address the audience and not each other. That's what makes us a forum rather than a debate. Um, civility will be maintained, no name calling or other bad behavior by either the candidates or the audience, uh, but I don't think that will be a problem by anybody. Uh, no applause except after the introduction of the candidates and the end of the forum. Those are sticking together. Um, Nowcast is recording this forum. That's the camera over there. Um, the video will be available for viewing in a day or two on the Nowcast website, nowcastsa.com, and on the League website, lwbsa.org. So anybody that lives in this district that you know that isn't here tonight, please tell them they can see this entire forum and it will help them make a good decision at polls. Uh, we don't get anything for pushing people to see it. We don't get travel points or anything <laughs> like that. It's just, you know, we want everybody to, uh, to see it before they vote. Um, one more thing, I am required to read the League mission or this is not an official event, so. The League of Women Voters, a nonpartisan organization, does not support or oppose any political party or candidate. It encourages informed and active participation of citizens in their government and works to increase understanding of major public policy issues. It is a volunteer grassroots organization that has fought since 1920 after winning the right for women to vote to improve our government and engage all citizens in the decisions that impact their lives. Now, please take, make sure your cell phones are off, and we'll get started by introducing the candidates. Republican Fred Ron Hill was born in Corpus Christi, and what they say about people to moving, moving to Texas can be said about San Antonio, too. He got here as fast as he could. He graduated from Memorial High School in the Edgewood ISD and went on to earn an architecture degree from the University of Pennsylvania. He's the founder and president of Adco Master Builders, which does private and commercial remodeling and construction. And he's done construction for Northeast and Northside ISDs. He's been involved in the community, serving on several boards, committees, and commissions, church boards, and as former director and president of his homeowners association. He's been active in the Republican Party. He has also run for San Antonio City Council twice and has managed other candidates' campaigns, including handling fundraising activities and candidate support systems. I'm exhausted just reading that, much less than reading. Democrat Ray Lopez spent his early years in Charlotte, Texas, which you could maybe call a suburb of Jordanton, but moved north in time to go to high school at Harlandale High. 
After graduating, he enlisted in the Army Reserve and served for 14 years. He was first elected to office in 1990 when he won a position on the Northside ISD Board of Trustees and served three terms, including as board president. After he was elected to the Board for Education Service Center Region 20, where he served until stepping down to run for the San Antonio City Council in 2009 to represent District 6. He held that seat until 2017, when he was term limited from running again. <clears throat> until he joined City Council, he was also working for AT&T, from which he retired as an executive after 34 years. Whichever of these men you pick, you know you're getting a hard worker. So let's begin the forum. these sorted out so the similar ones are together. Okay, who are we going to start? I think I defaulted since you handed me the mic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just because you were sitting there. Okay. Mr. Lopez, do you support the fetal heart beat bill that is currently being proposed? Uh, I haven't had a, an opportunity to read the entire thing, but what I've, the summaries that I've heard, uh, no, I don't. Uh, would you like to explain why? Well, uh, first of all, I, I believe that it's every woman's right to, first of all, have an opportunity to make decisions. Uh, we would certainly all hope that those decisions are in the best, uh, you know, in the best thought of the child and her. Uh, I believe because of that, I think it's important that we allow women to make that kind of choice. I would also hope that as women are having to make that difficult choice, it would also include the, the spouse or the husband or the, the, the partner that uh, helped conceive that child. Uh, because I think it is a, a choice that needs to be made by, by both individuals that are involved. Uh, uh, but I do believe at the end of the day, uh, uh, I would fall on the side of, of allowing a woman to make that decision. And I believe that that really takes that decision away from her. Right now, the law, I believe, uh, declares the time limit at uh, 20 weeks. Uh, and uh, I would support leaving it there. Mr. O'Hill, do you support the fetal heartbeat bill? Um, I believe that that in every case, regardless of the situation and timing of either partial term or full term, in no way would I ever support uh, an abortion bill that will kill another embryo or child. Okay, we're going to reverse the order. Take sure. turns to go back. Okay, Mr. Ron Hill, do you support appealing the recently passed paid sick leave ordinance uh, via the Texas legislature? The paid sick leave act, um, I think with all well intentions, uh, leaves several things out. And I'm going to give you an example. There is a manufacturing plant that, uh, that has contracts with the hospitals, and his contract uh, limits the amount that is being spent on every particular contract. And to allow a change in, in the extension of, of that particular bill would harm the businesses that have contracts that, that they cannot increase um, in that particular way. So the answer is absolutely not because the, the businesses would struggle to support that type of decision because of their existing contracts. Thank you. The paid sick leave was decided at the city level after I got off the of council. Had I been on council, I would have supported the move that the council did uh, for uh, uh, many reasons. But the most important reason 
is because I really believe that it's imperative that our municipalities have the opportunity to have local control. If a municipality makes a decision that that's what they want to do, if you want to argue that it's a, uh, a competitive disadvantage or whatever, it is an issue of local control, and I believe that that's exactly the way it should be. If it gets moved forward at the state level, uh, but we'd certainly be interested to see the dialogue and the, the, the language of that. Uh, and quite honestly, uh, the chances of it passing at the state level or getting, uh, uh, I guess if you will, killed at the, at the state level is probably pretty high simply because it's more than likely a partisan, a partisan split on the vote. Uh, I would hope that there would be uh, good discussion on both sides to try to make sure that it's the least intrusive on not only the employees, but also on, on uh, the issue of local control. Mr. Mr. Lopez, uh, do you support Medicaid expansion and or Representative Trey Martinez's uh, pre-existing coverage bill that he recently filed? Yeah, absolutely I do. And uh, the issue on, on the expansion of Medicaid is really going to be tied to where we're going to get the funding to be able to support that. Uh, there are areas where the state has an opportunity to be able to parcel out some dollars that will be able to support Medicaid. But Medicaid and Medicare and all the issues that are surrounding it are incredibly important, not only for the young folks in our community that need that type of support, but also the elderly. Uh, while I was on council, I was very adamant and, and focused on making sure that we got a good benefit package for our seniors. I've always felt that if, as uh, folks that create uh, laws, folks that create ordinances, if you take care of ch uh, children and take care of seniors, you know, the folks in the middle, you know, uh, as much as you want to uh, you, you give them credit, but I mean, they have to kind of do it on their own, uh, the best that they can, with as much help as they can get. But generally speaking, uh, if the government will take care of children and the seniors, I uh, think that you know we, we've invested our time and effort well. Want to ask a question? Do you support Medicaid expansion and or Representative Trey Martinez's pre-existing coverage bill that he recently filed? All right. So you have two areas. One existing and the other expansion. Obviously, the existing is already under law, and and obviously, you know, that's something that's supportable. Uh, to to understand uh, going forward about Medicaid and and those benefits, um, I would first like to see where the funds are to pay for it. You never move into a direction without knowing how you're going to pay for it. So at this point, it's difficult to give you an answer that I would support because I do not know where the funds would come from to be able to expand it. Mr. Ronhill, how will you support funding education, teacher pay, and retired teachers? There are several things that, that are inequitable within, within, within teacher or, or school finance. And I will tell you that, that I'm a byproduct of, of having seen many of those issues, many problems through the Edgewood District and then comparatively to the Northside School District. So I've lived in those two districts of three in this HD25 for 50 years. But I will tell you that, that the funding, um, I'm a businessman. I look to the areas where we have inequity, where we have bad spending, where we have bad law to be able to spend in the wrong areas. I, I am an efficiency broker. And so I look to, uh, like a normal business man would, you look to, to, to define the costs, to try to find, to reduce those costs, and also to find a way to increase the services and products for the same, for the same amount. Uh, thank you. Well, that's a big, uh, big ticket item that I think is going to get a lot of attention to the legislature this year. Uh, they're certainly talking about uh, approximately $9 billion that have been identified uh, that's on the table uh, by the State Comptroller's Office that will be parsed out for the, the big ticket items. Education and transportation are at the top of that heap. Uh, but to be able to sustain uh, investments in education, we have to do one thing first, and that's fix the formulas by which the state distributes the dollars. We all have heard over, over the last 25 years about so-called Robin Hood and the you take from one to get to the other. Uh, we've gone through trying to fix that uh, several times, all the way up to the, the Supreme Court. It's never uh, passed muster of the Supreme Court to the point where the court said, don't come back for 10 years. Leave it in place and try to fix it, figure something out. So the very first thing we have to do is fix the formulas. 
The second thing that's going to be incredibly important is to generate revenues that will be dedicated specifically for education. But we can't just say we're going to give teachers pay. That's exactly what we need to be doing, but we need to go beyond that. We also need to be providing uh, pay increases for all staff, all educators, to me, custodians, cafeteria workers, all of those individuals that walk into that campus are educators. Uh, we also need to make sure that, that their benefit packages are commensurate with the work that they're doing so they don't leave the industry, so that we can take advantage of, of their experience. And uh, uh, there are methods and uh, ways of being able to do that, and I hope to be up in Austin to be able to accomplish it. Mr. Lopez, do you support universal background checks on gun sales? Uh, yes. Uh, I, I think that there's got to be a little bit more of an extensive uh, uh, background check on, uh, on on gun sales, and I'll tell you one area specifically that I believe needs to be looked at very, very carefully, and I think would hope that there would be bipartisan support for this. You know, today, if I go in, into an academy and want to buy a gun, I have to, I mean, I'm going to go through some, some routine of providing identification. If I happen to be on the TSA no-fly list, that list does not get reviewed. And I would say, if you're on the TSA no-fly list, you probably ought to be held back the opportunity to buy a gun readily. Uh, there are some areas where we should be able to go out and create some reasonable uh, uh, assessments of whether an individual should have a gun or not. I don't, and, and I can tell you right now, many of my friends, certainly those of us that uh, that, uh, that that follow the Democratic side, always get accused, uh, uh, accused of they want to take our guns, and the answer is I don't want to take your guns. I don't want anybody taking my guns. I believe that the right to have that is there and declared in the Constitution. But I do believe that there needs to be some reasonable some reasonable discussion on both sides of the aisle that says there's just some things that we really shouldn't be doing. And that TSA is, uh, example that I gave you is one of, uh, of a handful of others that probably could be considered, and I would hope, would have bipartisan support. Do you support universal background checks on gun sales? There's a difference between universal uh, gun sales and actually going up to buy a gun. When the universal, and, and the particulars on that particular ruling or, or, or the intent is that can you buy or sell outside of the normal realm? And it harbors, this issue harbors on, on the protection of the Second Amendment. The minute that you begin to, to, to dissect and break down our right in the Second Amendment, it goes away. That's, that's how abortion got away. And, and I think that, that it's just wrong to, to begin to work away and chip away at a law that has already been created by our forefathers a long time ago because they had a battle between, between another country and the right to protect themselves. So I would tell you uh, I would not support universal um, gun law. Okay, uh, keeping into the, in the same realm, how do you feel about the idea of arming teachers? Hmm. Interesting. If the law gives you the right to bear arms, then why would we break the law and start to stop the situation? See, that particular question also goes, is it okay to do this in churches? Is it okay to do it in public places where that's, that's been the discussion? But I've got to tell you, again, it harbors on changing the very basic law of the Second Amendment, giving us the right to bear arms. If the teacher so desired to do this and they wanted to apply within the law to have the right to do so, they should have the privilege. On the service and as deep as it could possibly get, I would not support teachers being required to carry guns. That, to me, is one of the you know, one of the most egregious uh, propositions that we can make to a teacher. They have their hands full dealing with children. Not to mention the argument of just the general nature of teachers is they are carrying individual and probably wouldn't be the type that would carry a gun. But that that goes beyond the discussion here. I do think we need to do something, and what we can do is to provide more security, provide more dollars from the state to have secure security officers in our in our schools. We also need to be providing a 
smaller ratio between counselors and students. Right now we have anywhere from 600 to 900 to 1,200 students per counselor. If we can get that counselor ratio, counselor to student ratio down, those uh, uh, counselors will be able to identify if there are any kids in the school that perhaps have some propensity to create something different, uh, wrong. Uh, we've got to be able to do those kinds of things. Walking around with a gun to take a, uh, a shot at somebody that you think may be creating a, a bad a scenario, it, it does not make sense at all to me. Uh, and I can tell you that, that uh, as a parent, it doesn't make sense. And I can assure you that as a leg legislator, I would never support something like that. Mr. Lopez, what can be done to make San Antonio a less costly place for retirees, specifically lower their property taxes? I'd be all for that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that I'm retired. Well, and you're absolutely right. It's the lowering of the property taxes that is the dilemma. The question becomes, who do you lower the pro property taxes to? Today, we all know that at 65, you get a, an automatic $10,000 uh, exemption on your home. Uh, we should be able to have additional discounts or uh, exemptions for folks that are 65 or other individuals that can carry some level of, of distinction that, that warrant it. That, that would take some discussion. But it needs to be on, uh, capped at a certain level. I mean, if you're going to go out and give a tax abatement to somebody that has a million dollar house, that's a pretty large number. If you go give, uh, uh, if you go give that same percentage to someone that has a 60, 70, 80 thousand dollar house, like many of our school districts in the inner city do have today, uh, you're not really giving them much, it's just a few cents that you're actually offering them as a, as a as tax relief. Then the second part of that discussion is, if you're going to cut the tax, then what programs are you going to cut? Because I can tell you, that's the source of revenue that municipalities, states, counties, and everybody has to fund the projects that we need. So if you're going to cut the taxes, you've got to have the discussion around what programs then will you be cutting. And unfortunately, the ones that get put on the block, typically, are the social programs. And, I certainly wouldn't allow that to happen under my uh, leadership. What can be done to make San Antonio a less costly place for retirees, specifically lower their property tax? It, it is one way that we can help seniors. We, we must do everything possible to be able to maintain um, a fixed uh, rate for senior citizens that have fixed incomes. It's difficult. Is uh, my my mother's eighty one. She, you know, she. I can see quickly, you know, how the things affect her. But I will say this: the policy of property tax being at the number or, or eight percent every year of increase started when uh, Jimmy Carter passed a law that that basically you had a thirteen percent um, uh, interest rate and maybe nine and a half cost of living, and they allowed eight percent. But we're at 2.1% right now cost of living and interest rates at 3 and 4. And so why are we paying 8% based on an old law? So the answer is you reduce it, and I'm with the governor to uh, have a 2.5% cap on property taxes to help not just seniors but homeowners. How does your experience of living in this district prepare you for being our state representative? Well, certainly, um, and, and I believe it's my turn, isn't it? Oh, yes. Okay. Well, certainly, um, having having a grown, um, homegrown here at Edgewood District and, and living in, in Northside here the second second half uh, of, of my life with my wife here, um, I've seen the, the disparity. I've seen the many things that have changed over time and some of the things that haven't. I've seen where, where at the beginning there were there were schools that still exist, situations where some schools didn't have air conditioning, where, where you know, Fox Tech and, and also Lanier didn't have air conditioning. And so I look at the disparities, and I believe that, that, that in this scenario, that we should create a way to bring equality back and bring, bring situations to fairness. I think that's a priority that, that I represent. Well, thank you. I won't go into the details that were already covered earlier. I was on the school board for uh, for nine years, and I was on the city council for eight years, and I, all that experience that I that I could gather from there. But let me talk about what I did in the last couple of years. Uh, once I got off the, the city council, I got onto a, a organization called the San Antonio Mobility Coalition, 
one of the things that we do as a mobility coalition is to try to identify dollars at the state and the federal level to bring to San Antonio to try to build highways and roads uh, and things of that nature, improve transportation. Uh, I have been doing that for the last couple of years uh, as the SAMCO chairman. Uh, and prior to that, I was the chairman for an organization called the Metropolitan Planning Organization, which basically did the same thing, but I did it as an elected official. Uh, I can tell you that I understand the issues in this community, whether it's education, whether it's uh, transportation issues, or even job creation over the course of the last uh, 20 years that I worked uh, either with AT&T uh, uh, in, in their uh, uh, marketing division or with actually with the city of San Antonio leading trade delegations around the country trying to recruit businesses to come to San Antonio and get a clear understanding of why we need to have jobs, why we need to have an education system that provides the workforce for those jobs and get those individuals to stay here in San Antonio. I've been quite engaged in that over the course of the last 20 to 30 years, and I believe that that's, a, that's what gives me uh, a unique perspective on, on what we need here in San Antonio. Thank you. What is your opinion of the recent attempted voter purge by <coughs> Texas Secretary of State and Governor Abbott? Voter purging is undemocratic. We should be increasing the opportunity to have people come vote. I want to hold them accountable for identifying themselves and having the, the, co the correct identification in the process. But in today's world, in 2019, we're actually dissuading people from coming to vote, completely undemocratic. And that is not what our forefathers put into the Constitution. We should be opening up the opportunity uh, for more folks to vote. But what's really more important than opening up the processes is that we need to educate from a policy perspective the citizens. I've been block walking for the last month and a half since the, the day that, the, that this race began. And a lot of people say, well, gee, there's a lot of voter apathy out there. There is some voter apathy. People want to know what is going on. I can tell you, I spend an awful lot of time at people's doorsteps, not only talking about education, but specifically about the programs that they feel need to be addressed in education. People are interested. They're not apathetic. They want to be able to get into a position to have a say. So uh, I, I would hope that what we would be doing is opening the process up uh, to, in the way that our democratic society uh, should. Other countries don't. We do. What is your opinion of the recent attempted voter purge by the Texas Secretary of State and Governor Abbott? The biggest difference that I see that the Governor Abbott was making is, is a clarity between legal voters and illegal voters. And obviously the, the purging is, is a clear, clear cut path. And and if it if it's ninety-five thousand or seventy-five thousand, in my opinion, this is not about the citizens having the right to vote. This is about illegals taking over the system that was never meant to be until you become a citizen. Okay, here's a different one for you. What is your most embarrassing moment? <laughs> <laughs> wow. <clears throat> well, only my wife would know that, right? <laughs> you know, uh, I think we've had embarrassing moments um, all our lives, right? And and uh, whether it's on the ski slope and falling the first time, right? Not ever knowing what to do or... Um, just, just getting it wrong. But I think, I think that um, we, we are, we are natural human beings that are going to make mistakes. And obviously, I, I, I favor with, with, uh, with apologetics. It's called uh, to be able to talk to those that, okay, I did the wrong thing. Uh, we can move in the right direction, and and then do other things that that encourage others to do exactly that. Go in the right direction. You don't have enough time for me to tell you how many times I've been embarrassed. <laughs> Falling down a ski slope would be one of the two. But uh, really, I, I, you know, given a little bit of time to think about it, but you were talking about it, Fred, I, I, honestly, I guess as, as adults, usually uh, when we have an embarrassing moment is when we get called out on something, right? And as adults, we can call each other out all the time, and typically we can argue 
our position, and then we might walk away saying, well, I agree or don't disagree, but we walk off as, as adults. But whenever a child calls you out, when a child points something out to you that you might have done, said, or pretended, or acted like you might believe in, and they question, and then they ask you, why did you do that? I have a circumstance like that with, uh, with, my, with my granddaughter, as a matter of fact. We were talking about different issues, and I won't go into the actual issues that we're talking about, but she said, well, Grandpa, I, I don't believe that. That's, that's not what I think is, it, it, it ought to be. And we had a really good discussion. Uh, we wound up, I wound up agreeing that she was probably right. And I mean, the topic was around uh, uh, divorce and, you know, who and how and who should get custody and things of that nature. And, and of course, the very first thing that, that a parent will go was, well, divorce is bad things. That shouldn't happen. Everybody should go. But she had a completely different perspective. Unfortunately, she experienced that. Uh, uh, and, and it was interesting because it was rather embarrassing, but it was enlightening as well to know that a child at that age had that that depth of, of consciousness. What are your views on Texas legalizing pot? Texas, Texas legalizing pot? Yes. Well, uh, product of the 60s, and I am not going to admit whether I smoked or inhaled. <laughs> I ain't going there. Uh, you know, uh, from a practical perspective, uh, legalizing pot is becoming more of a, an acceptable trend, whether it's the medical uh, components of marijuana or all, all the things that come in. But there's a secondary piece to that, and that's the revenue stream. Uh, I think what's important is for us to take a look at other states like Colorado and a handful of others that have done it. And let me tell you, they haven't done it uh, without a whole lot of consternation. They, they, they have suffered. They have suffered greatly uh, uh, because it wasn't implemented correctly. So I think if it becomes something that sent that, that Texas begins to embrace, what we need to do is take a look at all of the other states that have done it, and if we're going to do it, do it correctly. And the same thing holds true for all of the other, quote-unquote, vice taxes, right? Whether we go down to gambling issues, things of that nature, there is revenue to be generated by, by it, but there are also lives that can be broken by it, and I think it's important that we, we, we do it in a very cautious and, and thoughtful way. But I would, I, I would certainly engage in the discussion to try to figure out a, a positive way forward. My particular belief on, on marijuana use is, is that you allow the door to be cracked open and it begins to go south. So that was my position and then I had a mother call me and talk to me concerning about their child and cannabis oil. And, and, and where it goes wrong is, is like California that you can walk in, and I've been right in front of those stores, that you, you can go in there and get a doctor right there to agree to sign that you medically need uh, marijuana and, and you're, you're capable of using it. And I, I just frown on allowing uh, that direction for our country. I wouldn't do it. Okay, there are several questions here, uh, immigration questions that I'm going to just combine here. Uh, how would you address the issue of reuniting children separated by ICE with their parents? Um, how do you feel about uh, DACA and SB4? I'll just combine those. Well, that's six minutes worth right there. <laughs> six? <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, particularly speaking on uh, on immigration and the separation of children, this question came to us to, from the Express News, and Dylan can, can you know vouch for that. But the the issue in my mind is is what happens in the streets of San Antonio when someone is drunk and driving and reckless and has a child in the back. What do you do? You separate the child and you take them to a secure place. And so when you bend the arena of perception that takes you down a road of misunderstanding that the children are being secured, not separated, you know, permanently. And that's not, not the case. So the second thing is that you mentioned the second arena, which was... Uh, well, DACA. 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 Let's leave it at those two. DACA was created by Obama after having, having sent 400,000 immigrants back to uh, back to their country and and then there was pressure 
to to have him support the Latino vote, which basically happened uh, right before the 2012 election, and turned it in such a way that you had twice that number, 800,000 that were allowed into a DAPA program that allowed them to be back in. So again, if it is going to be something beneficial to Americans, for America, I support it, but not any other way. All right, great. Uh, I'll start with DACA, maybe I'll do that in, in the time frame here. Uh, I certainly support the DACA program. When we it rolled out DACA in the very beginning, it was to get folks that had come here and were in the shadows, coming here for reasons to try to improve their lives. We told them, step up, register, and you'll be fine. And now we're trying to change that. That's not right. The second thing is these individuals that are here are contributing to society by virtue of getting an education and wanting to come into the workforce and keep that skill set that they got here in the United States here to be able to benefit our, our, our communities and our countries. Uh, I think it's incredibly important that we have a, a, a very solid DACA, a clear DACA program uh, that, that, that reinforces their ability to come out of the shadows, do what they need to get done, and then stay here. And let them be you good uh, contributing citizens. I'll quickly talk on the issue of separation of the children. Uh, I don't think that there's anybody that can argue that under any circumstance, that's a good scenario to be under. The way we did it there, and Fred, I, I, know, I certainly understand what you're saying about a child in the backseat of a car, the, 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 the parent is uh, being less than attentive to that child, but that is not what happened with those children that were crossing that border. They were leaving areas of peril. They were trying to save their children's lives. They weren't putting them in danger. They weren't putting them in peril, but we separated them anyway because of a ridiculous, idiotic policy that was edicted from the top. That is wrong. What is your stance on taking land from Texans through eminent domain to build the wall, border wall? Oh, well, when you said border wall, it changed things. But uh, <laughs> eminent domain in the state of Texas, we all realize, I mean, it is, is, is king. Uh, personal property rights are incredibly important and we have to do everything we possibly can to make sure that there's a process that allows landowners to be able to mitigate, to be able to go out and insist that they get due, due process and they get a fair value for their, for, their, for their property. The issue that I have of taking land on the border uh, uh, for the issue of, of, of the border wall uh, is not really my thought process. It's really me talking to folks like uh, Mayor Sines, who's the mayor of Laredo, that said, listen, if, if somebody wants to build something, build a dam. Don't build a wall. We don't need to keep folks from crossing over. They're coming over in 18 weavers with the drugs. They're, they're coming over with visas and then overstaying their visas. Go fix that. What you need to fix, if you want to spend money and create jobs in Texas, why don't you create a dam that stops the flooding of the Rio Grande through their community? Make sure that lives and cattle and property aren't lost. So if you're going to spend money, spend it where it's needed. We don't need the money being spent the way that it is. Uh, he made a point that I would have never thought uh, of sitting here a couple hundred miles away from the border, but indeed, he makes a good point. I think what, at the end of the day, what we need to be doing is asking the individuals that are directly infect, uh, affected, what is the best solution forward? And don't be making decisions based on, again, hyperbole and uh, you know, sound bites that, that, that you know, create uh, anger among the, the population. We need to start getting along and talking with each other. Sorry about that. Thank you. <laughs> what is your stance on taking land from Texans through eminent domain, eminent domain to build the border wall? Uh, obviously, there exists a process by which uh, people undergo the, the whole issue of eminent domain. I don't like it, but sometimes for the sake of the community and a, and a greater good, it needs to be done. But here, here is the, the issue that I have with is that the fairness of being paying a property owner what they're due is, should be handled correctly. Uh, I'm a businessman and so you, you negotiate and you've got to be happy to where you get to. But this question I think is broader when it talks about the border wall. And, and, and let me tell you, to me border wall is about national security. You have issues that drug cartels don't want you to build a wall. Why not? Well, because it make it harder for what it is that they're doing. We have child trafficking that exists. 
And we're denying because we don't want to talk about it. We have other issues where uh, sickness is being allowed. And, and, and they're coming and, and basically we're serving the needs and, and thank God that we can. However, the, the issue is, can others come to this country with the wrong intent and without a border wall, we will suffer. Do you support removing tolls on a road when it is paid for, not refinancing to keep the toll? Let me see. You said, do I support paying? Removing tolls on a road when it is paid for. Oh, okay. I, obviously, if you pay for it once, you're done. You know, let's, let's, not, let's not try to reinvent the wheel and come up with another tax, right, uh, for, for our citizens. Once something is paid for, take it away. Uh, we, had, we had a tax that, that was created for the Alamo Dome, and, and obviously we agreed for that to pay that tax. When it was time, it was removed. And so it needs to be removed the minute it gets paid. Well, I, I think I can speak with some expertise in this area. I've been in, in, the, uh, in that environment for quite some time, and I can tell you that if you take the word toll away from the, the dialogue, that four-letter word toll, it changes the perspective. If you call it a user fee, because that's what it is, it's a user fee. In most cases, tolls that are put in place have an alternate route for that individual to be able to drive on. It certainly would be that, that case here in San Antonio, and we did that by policy. Uh, so if you look at it as a user fee, folks that want to use it uh, and get the benefit of having faster, quicker lanes to get to, then they should be able to do that. The problem with taking away the user fee or the toll around that is, what are you going to do on the maintenance side of it? You've got to be able to have a revenue stream to maintain it, because what you're creating then is a, is a serious hazard. I mean, m many of us are aware of what's happened on, on, on Texas 130. Uh, you know, e and it isn't that old yet. Uh, the revenue stream is coming in. It's not coming in at the rate that it needed to. And what's suffering is the maintenance on that toll. Uh, the safeguards, for example, my understanding is that there's a significant problem with feral hogs coming across. Got an 85 mile an hour uh, uh, highway that you can zoom along, but we haven't put in the right protection to keep the feral hogs from crossing across. And we've gotten a handful of fatalities because of that. So uh, if, if, if you want to talk about toll roads, really you view them as a user fee. User fees are typical. I think most of us would prefer to pay a user fee than to have to pay for something that you wouldn't use at all. And uh, so uh, I, I do believe that tolls have a place. What is your position on the relationship between state and local options? state and local options as it relates to just regular governance is what I'm going to assume? I think what it's getting at is is the um, where the state is um, taking over some of the yeah. I, I don't mean that to sound well, yeah. uh, biased. I, no, I, I appreciate your, yeah. your, your being finessing the, the question. I, I, don't, I don't think I need to be biased. I think I could be pretty pointed about what I'm saying. If, you're, if the question is, and if the question or concern to clarify, if the question is, should the state be taking over municipal uh, uh, rights, the answer is no. Municipalities have a government that understands what's going on in the community. Whether I was on the school board or whether I was in, on the city council, and, and I know that Fred uh, also was a candidate in Block Walk, those are the people on the front lines that are talking to the folks that know what the problems are. Municipals, mun municipalities need to have the right to be able to self-govern, and, and at the state level, there are some things that should be done at the state level for uniformity's sake, but it needs to be in concurrence and in conjunction with the municipalities. What is your position on the relationship between state and local options? In, in my opinion, each has its own function and obviously needs to function independently to give the voice to the constituent to function independently. The, the issues of the state are bigger, they're larger. You know, you handle the issues of school, you, you handle the issues of finance over several other huge programs, whether it's, it's Medicare, Medicaid, those, those issues there. But, but obviously the, the performance of each one it's important that, that you allow that access to the constituent. 
that to me is the most important. I'm going to get it right by the end. Okay. I realize I never gave you your time for opening Thank statements. You. <laughs> 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 so, do you want me to begin? Well, I, you can do an open slash close statement. <laughs> so we get four minutes. Well, I'll give you three minutes. <laughs> Give me three minutes well, each. For certainly, I, I, I'm appreciative of the fact that every one of you made it here. It, it, is, uh, it is a good thing that, that uh, you have individuals uh, that are concerned about their community. And obviously, I want to thank the, uh, the League of Women Voters for putting this together and the uh, City of Leon Valley for giving us the, the place to be able to hear. I don't know if you paid them for it, but uh, you know, certainly that, that they opened up the door. Um, I, I will say this, that, that obviously, you know, when, when you consider running a race for state, it, it, is, it is more about, uh, I believe, um, moral character, and I think we, we, we both, I think, are, are, are good moral men. But the issues and how we represent those issues, obviously, are in the minds of those that, that say, look, I, I favor this or I favor that, and then some that, that will disagree. But in America, we have that right to have a difference of opinion. In America, we can have a difference of opinion and still be able to dialogue. In America, we are given rights that other countries don't have as rights, whether it's faith or whether it's being able to choose a profession or being able to, to do the things that we do in our free time, such as art and doing the different things that we do. But I think in the end, it, it, is, it is important, just like you came today, this is the most important thing that you can do, just listen in on the conversation and be able to say, okay, I favor this and I favor that. And, and I thank you for that opportunity. Uh, I'm sure there'll be more opportunity after the meeting to discuss more questions, but thank you very much for being here tonight. I can sing a song, but that's three minutes. <laughs> you only have a minute. He may be willing to sing, don't let me sing. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to let me sing. I actually sang in the church choir of a member of Prince of Peace. We've been members there since we moved into the community back in 1984. And my wife and I were on the choir, and uh, they let me come up there, but they wouldn't allow me to plug in my mic. That tells you how bad I, was, <laughs> how bad I am. And I guess as I got closer and closer uh, and deeper and deeper into politics, I guess people wanted to take the mic away from me then, too. Uh, but you know what? At the end of the day, nobody is here to take anybody's mic away. Nobody is here to tell anybody what you, what you think is wrong could be different. It could be a different approach. Uh, we may settle up in our own mind differently. But at the end of the day, San Antonians have a unique perspective on what they want. Uh, we have done a lot of block walking, a lot of door knocking. I can tell you, I know Fred does, does it well. I've done it with him. Uh, uh, and, and, and I know that we go out there and we passionately talk to folks and try to listen to what they want. What they want is no different than what my wife asks of me, what my kids ask of me. We want things to be affordable. We want things to be available. We'll work for it. But we just need it to be affordable and available. And I think we follow that in our governance model. If we go to Austin, or ultimately if anybody winds up going to, to Washington and keeps that mindset, it would be a good thing for, for America, for Texas, for San Antonio. But what's happening today, unfortunately, and it isn't happening here, I can tell you that. But what's happening in, during the campaigns, we become visceral, we become vile, we become angry with each other, we hate each other. We say bad things about each other, and consequently, everyone that supports one candidate or the other then hates each other. If you do that on the campaign trail, how in the world are you going to go and govern when you have the responsibility of leading this state or this country in the right direction? You can't do that. We may have different principles. We may have varying degrees of our interpretation of those principles, but at the end of the day, we've got to listen to each other. We've got to listen to our neighbors and quit you know, arguing and start listening. You know what? Most of the time, and I, I say this in... Joking but true, uh, between my wife and I, which we, uh, we just celebrated 48 years of marriage last week, and I can tell you that I always like to say that you know we don't agree uh, agree on everything all the time. And she goes, 
Oh, you agree with me all the time, don't you? <laughs> in the marriage, it's a little different than it is in government. In government, we have a process. That process, many of us have fought and died for. I have been uh, had the honor of serving in the military, uh, uh, in the army. Uh, my my son did as well. I've got a grandson that just graduated from the, from the navy, and it is generational to want to make sure that. The United States has those kinds of principles that allows people to say, just give me a hand up. I don't need a hand up, just give me a hand up. I'm hurting, can you help me? If we listen to those folks, they're gonna be on all sides of the aisle. And we actually reach out to them, I think our country will be better. I promise to do that. I promise to take that as, a, as my mindset. If, uh, if I'm fortunate enough, and I would ask that, that I would ask for your support, thank you. On behalf of the league, we uh, thank you for coming here tonight. Uh, we have a half an hour meet and greet uh, where you can talk to the candidates all you want. And hopefully they'll answer you. <laughs> uh, I'm sure they will. Uh, we can do it right here in this room. There's some campaign material uh, out there and, of course, some uh, league material, too. We always have that around. So uh, please take advantage of this next half hour and please go out and vote. Thank you.